All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Welcome to the fifth session in the series of IPPN Knowledge Cafes, the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network. My name is Dr. Ankiro Kadidigu. You can call me Kiki. I'm the Senior Interagency Affairs Specialist at UNFPA, and I support the IPPN along with colleagues from UNDP, UNICEF, ILO, and FAO. Just as a quick refresher for all of us, the IPPN, the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network, is an initiative of nine founding UN entities to create a community space where we can share lessons and experiences and strengthen our collective capacities to deploy practical applications of integrated policy approaches in support of the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. IPPN is open to colleagues across government, the UN system, academia, and the broader development community. So really open to all. There's been a series of monthly knowledge cafes to showcase insightful experiences from the field of practical applications of policy integration. And in today's session, we will focus on foresight, a tool that is increasingly being considered by the UN system and other sectors as a methodology for envisioning alternative futures. And I mean, given the volatility in the world around us, you can see why this tool is incredibly important. So the UN country team in Kyrgyzstan has recently deployed foresight to support the design of the UN Sustainable Development Corporation framework, the UNSDCF. In a context of high uncertainties and volatility, characterized by overlapping shocks, political upheaval, regional conflict, and indeed a global pandemic, which we're all still recovering from, the UNCT devised a range of policy scenarios for potential development pathways in Kyrgyzstan with the aim of identifying policy priorities for the UNSDCF. Unfortunately, the RC, Mr. Ozonia Ojielo, who is um, a brother from my own country, Nigeria, had to prioritize a last minute meeting with the government. However, I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Kotmola Abdul Ghaniev, who will share with us the country team's experiences and the lessons learned from this scenarios exercise. Kotmola currently serves as a peace and development advisor in the RC's office in Kyrgyzstan. Prior to Kyrgyzstan, he served in the same capacity in Tajikistan until 2010. He was head of Abkhazia office at UNDP Georgia from 2016 to 2018. And earlier in his career, he worked as planning, monitoring, and evaluation officer for Ebola Response Multipartner Trust Fund in Sierra Leone, as well as, as a program analyst and m and &E analyst positions in UNDP in Ukraine. So before I hand over to Kurt Mola for his insightful experiences that he'll share with us today, a small note on housekeeping. Um, colleagues, please make sure that your microphones are muted to allow colleagues hear the presenter do use the chat function to ask questions, to share your insights, experiences, comments. And after the presentation, we will have enough time for um, an interactive session, Q&A, and for colleagues who wish to share their comments and their questions. So without further ado, Patmola, we're very happy to have you, and I hand over the floor. Over to you. Thank you, Kiki. Thank you, colleagues, uh, Serge, uh, everyone, and thank you for joining this session. Uh, I would be happy to share our experience, the Kyrgyzstan UNCT experience uh, in scenario planning. Uh, just to give you some background that the scenario planning uh, uh, was uh, taken, uh, took place in 2021 in the process of the development of the cooperation framework. Uh, I will go straight to the, uh, to the presentation. Uh, the, the first question, of course, why we decided to do this. Uh, the, uh, it, there were several, uh, several uh, underlying uh, purposes and rationales behind it. First of all, there has been important political changes in Kyrgyzstan in 2020, ended up with the new presidential elections, new president, new parliament. The new president has uh, triggered and initiated the, the adoption of the new constitution and new electoral law has been uh, adopted and a new and the government adopted has uh, has adopted a new development plan 2021 uh, 2026. We also saw multiple crises of the in service delivery like electricity fuel prices growth 
And at the same time, we also launched consultations on the UNSDCF. So we realized that we find ourselves in a very volatile and unpredictable environment and that we need a greater understanding what is going on. Uh, and the primary goal, of course, was to understand this dynamic and the shared vision. Because I think that what is important to speak about the scenarios, when you see in the end, uh, it might seem so obvious, kind of, uh, so like everything, everything we know. And many agencies have their own capacity to analyze and to adapt to the situation. But at the same time, what is important is that everyone in UNCT has the same understanding, is to bring the you know, understanding and knowledge and thinking about what the situation is and how it impact, uh, may impact the United Nations and the country is shared by everyone, by the all UN country team. I think this is the, uh, and honestly for me, uh, it's uh, primarily a learning ex exercise which fits other processes of which I will talk about it. But I think that it's, it's very important, like primary learning analytical exercise of uh, understanding the country. Uh, again, uh, how we started it, we initially, uh, uh, in the RCO, we uh, did a learning ourselves. So actually, Ozonia even brought a couple of books from New York uh, when he was visiting his family. And we, we read them. We uh, uh, you know, participated ourselves in the courses to understand what the scenario planning is by ourselves. Uh, then uh, there has been several uh, considerations how to engage. First, we wanted to engage you know, big companies. Uh, it proved out to be very expensive, by the way. Uh, I, I don't know. I can share this is the community of the UN. The cost of the senior uh, kind of very top-notch company between one hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars for the scenario exercises, uh, but then we decided to do mostly uh, using our own, our, our own internal resources, but with uh, inviting an in external uh, coordinator and facilitator for the workshop. Uh, and what is impor important uh, to do also in the beginning is that. First, we learn as RCO learn, the, those who lead the process or coordinate the process, yes? And the second is that we presented the idea for the um, scenario planning to the UNCT. Uh, and we had to uh, address some of the misconceptions which often uh, take place when we speak about scenario planning. That foresight is not forecasting, because we, th we speak about plausible scenarios, not possible or likely scenarios. Because I, I, I will say about it later that the scenarios which we come, which come in the end sometimes can feel strange or crazy. That's why uh, we should not be clo closing our eyes and, and our minds to what, is, what seems impossible at the moment. And the scenario planning is a proactive and non, non, not reactive. And again, as I said that for us, the process was as important as the product. Because this, uh, the process leads to the joint understanding which, and joint language of speaking about the problem. So that when we discuss the, for example, strategic priorities for the outcomes for the cooperation framework, all, a, all heads of agencies around the table already have this understanding. A scenario planning exercise is very inclusive. So we included, of course, all the heads of agencies. But in our case, we also included PMT. PMT program management team has been the focal key focal uh, entity at the technical level to discuss it, bring unimaginable insights, because these are DRRs or ARRs essentially, bringing their expertise also from many other countries. And uh, this is, uh, and we also uh, make it inclusive because we uh, had several stages, I will explain, we always invited national experts and national capacities to contribute to our thinking, because we as expats, you know, we have certain feelings, certain perspectives, but the people living here, experts, uh, have, have different ones. Uh, and we had actually our uh, uh, scenario planning exercise had several stages. The first, which I don't come as a phase, is uh, RMR, risk and, uh, risk, uh, Regional Monthly Review Process, which you know uh, many countries go through. And uh, actually, Kyrgyzstan did it in February uh, 2021, so a couple of months before that we started the scenario exercise. So the results of the RMR has already fed our CCA, for example, but also our thinking about scenarios. Then uh, we carried out an online survey uh, about key risks in the country. So we wanted to understand what is the perception of the 
country team and national experts and nationally non-UN staff uh, about country, where it goes, what are the main priorities, what are the main risks, issues, uh, so whether it's shrinking democracy or deterioration of the governance, economy, instabilities, etc. And we had uh, quite a good response, 28 respondents, 17 UN staff, uh, internationals, nations, women, men, so every, everything, it, and it fed to our understanding. We started our workshop with presenting the results of this, so we also can kickstart with the common understanding. It's important to note that the RMR online survey and CCA were already ready when we started the workshop, this phase number two. So it's important that we build on a knowledge and there are data to which we agree upon and this data is shared. It's important because, uh, you know, uh, me as, let's say WHO, I, I know about the health, but I don't know about the food situation and the vice versa. Yes, WFP knows about food, but doesn't know about health. So when we have the whole CCA, the whole country team understands about many multiple areas. So this is very important. So the second phase was the three days exercise workshop, which was, uh, which was led by the external consultant. The fourth element was a strategic prioritization retreat. The scenarios which were developed and accelerators which were discussed uh, were, uh, were a starting point for the UNSDCF prioritization retreat. So we spent essentially almost, almost a day, slightly less, but almost a day to, to use these scenarios to plan, to plan our actions. And also the fourth phase, after the scenarios, uh, after the UNSDCF has been drafted already, all key four outcomes, we have four outcomes now of, of the cooperation framework. We did a stress testing exercise, which we stressed against so-called window tunneling uh, methodology. So we basically stress testing whether this will work in under each outcome will work under certain scenarios and what we need to increase or you know address if the situation changes so to kind of uh, in, in ensure adaptability i know that i'm talking too much but again let's let's iterate let uh, reiterate important that it's knowledge based engaging external exercise un staff uh, uh, both national and international external experts. We also uh, brought six external experts to the workshop itself, which they say that this is the first time in their history that UN is so open that invites to these internal discussions and very honest discussions about the country, as you know. So we invited economists, head of the creative business, religious sphere, and we also f uh, invited a former president of the country who participated in our workshop. Uh, inclusive and iterative. So these discussions, uh, it's very important for me to underline this because we initially thought that, you know, UNCT and UNCT actually advised us to bring the PMT and the engaging PMT was one of the greatest decisions because during this decision, actually, yeah, too important because we initially thought that the scenario would work for the CCA. And actually the C PMT said, no, let's not do it for CCA, but bridge the CCA and UNSDCF. So this very critical and very important decision was actually made by, BM, by PMT and proposed by, by PMT. And engaging UNCT in design, for example, we didn't have the money for the expert and the UNCT when we discussed and present the whole idea and we presented the options how we can organize it, whether it would take a company or in-house. And UNDP says, we have money, we will fund the, the expert. And they did fund an expert. So this is very important that, you know, it's iterative, multiple, you know, engagements, and we, we go one by one. And of course, it, it has to be linked with the decision-making process, because scenario is not just for scenarios, but to bring something tangible, at least in terms of the decision-making. So what about the, um, uh, the workshop itself? Uh, so what is important is developing a, a shared language in the beginning. It's exactly what is the risk, what is the scenario itself? What means the forecasting and foresighting how different they are? We uh, invited special guest speakers. As I said, we invited the six experts uh, from, uh, from non-UN non family. Uh, so they gave us in-depth understanding on what is going on in the religious sphere because religious and traditionalization and the tension and polarization between the cult, traditional and Islamic values and the liberal values is growing. So we gave the different you know, perspectives of how the country goes. We in introduced very much gamification and interactive sessions. And the overall structure was that we analyzed drivers and trends, critical uncertainties, 
modeling the scenario, and then we analyze the impact of the of different scenarios for UN, understanding what uh, programming will be relevant for under each scenario, uh, and also see how the real life uh, corresponds to our scenarios. Because we have to be, I mean, some people were saying, again, we are, you know, uh, flying in the uh, clouds, yes, and the operational, when you have to procure one thing for half a year, it's always, you know, you know crushes our dreams, which we, we put into the scenario process. Um, so this is this was the workshop I idea. What was the result of the workshop? And I think that that was one of the most interesting thing, which is very difficult to be understood for the people who did not participate in a, in, in this exercise. In the end, we created a crazy futures scenarios. And this, when we speak about scenarios, it's exactly the way like it's a movie scenario. So we say that you know. Uh, something happens, revolution happens, a woman leader came, come, comes to the power and there is a nuclear plan, uh, nu uh, nuclear tails, uh, you know, leakage uh, leading to environmental uh, disaster. So we build these scenarios in a different, you know, components taking environment, uh, social, economic situation. Uh, in our case, again, as I say, we came up with it quite traditionally, uh, traditional uh, uncertainties, because after the identifying like, I don't know, 15 key trends, we identify two key uncertainty. And of course, again, we come, what is it? It's economic situation. We don't know how the economy will develop and the polarization, social cohesion in the country. So essentially political situation, right? So if you, will, if you look at this from this point of view, oh, it's so obvious. It's of course like key to uncertainties. We don't know how the economy will behave and how the politics will behave. But I think that when it's when you to this level of the generalization, it's easy and it's very understandable and obvious. But when you start translating into scenarios and analyzing in a granularity of different factors and how they may interplay, uh, then it becomes interesting. In actually, uh, I think one of the UNCT member here I have seen joining Azamat, maybe he will also take, uh, uh, you know, one minute later on from UNFPA. He's the head of the UNFPA office in Kyrgyzstan. But I think that one of the interesting things is that actually we have been following and very clearly seeing, and UNCT speaks at a different uh, now meetings, even with the DSG recently visited, that the scenario number four, four which is the negative scenario, uh, worst scenario is actually developing because the situation with the you know Ukrainian Russian war and many other impact the, the developments in the country. But again, this we speak about the scenarios uh, or plaus plausible scenarios, not the you know what is possible and we think that the, this happen or not. What is the outcome of the scenarios? How we use them? First of all, again, it brought everyone to the same understanding of key peace development, human rights gaps and issues and plausible futures in, in relation of each of the, of the possibilities. Again, we should say that uh, also in UN, I'm, I've been uh, kind of, uh, how to say, um, in our particular context, it was much easier to imagine negative scenarios because we are, you know, critical people uh, kind of taking and understanding the risks and rather not looking into positive things. Uh, I noticed, noted myself that in the group work, the developing the negative scenario came much easier to UN than developing positive scenario. But that's exactly what we need to bring the positive scenario because everything can, is possible. Again, as I said that for the UNSDCF, how the scenario worked with, they were a point of departure in discussion of the UNSDCF strategic prioritization retreat, combining with the accelerators, then stress testing. And I have to say that we use also scenarios uh, in, in other thought processes, for example, in PBF program, peace building fund programming in the country. Um, lessons learned, and yeah, these are last two slides. I hope I will be on time. Uh, lessons learned and good practices. First of all, uh, I cannot reiterate more, strong political buy-in of the whole UNCT and, and informing them from the very beginning that we are thinking, we are planning about it, how we approach it, we inform them what it is, what we uh, receive in the end. Uh, critical also leadership of the UNRC for the success because he has to be, a, he, I mean, in our case, Ozonia has been a strong leader promoting this because this also requires additional resources of the RCO staff and many other agencies to be engaged into the, uh, into the process. Uh, 
We uh, documented almost, not almost, but every stage. So we do the concept, concept for the uh, scenario planning, we share this concept. When they present this concept and make a presentation for the UACT, we present this for PMT. So every step and decision is essentially documented. Uh, I don't speak about hundreds of documents, but like two, three documents in the end, which uh, identifies key, key elements. We look for internal UN resources. We are not alone in this. Uh, we have been supported by DCO, uh, Development Co Coordination Office, and DPPA in our case, because again, when we were considering options of doing in-house uh, with in-house uh, resources, uh, we thought that maybe DPPA can do it because they have now a unit of innovation unit cell, innovation cell dealing with that. UNESCO also has the experience and many others. Uh, engage UNCT in the early stage, participatory, I already saw, said this. Core team, again, RCO, as the lead, like two people in the RCO, I was the main coordinator, but also there was a deputy team leader uh, who supported me very strongly. And again, PMT uh, is essential to coordinate and to, to uh, it brought the discussion to the uh, next level because you, you bring like 10 people, 15 people, highly experienced, already done in some other countries, and then it, it like, it, 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 it blooms. Um, engage external resources, uh, people uh, from uh, non-UN, engage both also national and international staff. I, I think that voice of the national staff was very important uh, in our, in, on different uh, elements. We also did uh, innovative tools. I believe that the online questionnaire is, was a kind of innovation which we introduced, so we uh, gathered additional data. Um, ensuring senior management attendance at the workshop, which is not easy. In our case, we linked this workshop with the UNCT retreat. So it was a five-day commitment, two days of the UNCT retreat and three days right after for the scenario workshop. But bringing them in one place, as you understand, the senior management is very, is very busy, you know, and that's why it requires an uh, attendance. And we essentially, date was uh, approved two months before. Uh, so it's all advanced planning. Uh, again, advanced planning, every day, everything takes time. That's why, you know, every stage we, we consult, you know, every, doing a UNCT meeting, uh, it's always uh, takes, takes time because it's once a month. So it has to be planned. In our case, uh, the whole uh, scenario planning exercise from the moment we, we came out to UNCT started at March and ended in September. Uh, so it's six months. So plan for that, more or less, uh, if you want to, to achieve this kind of, um, to achieve meaningful participation, because it, it takes time for, to plan also. We believe that there shouldn't be no less than three days for the workshop. I know that scenario planning sometimes is done in one day. Sometimes there is an approach that uh, you, the country teams, which we consulted, because we were consulted other country teams on that, they do, for example, half day, half day, half day through, let's say, eight or 10 weeks. It's not always, we, we believe, and the experience of the consultant also said that it's not always kind of works because the, by the time you meet the second time, people already don't remember what they were speaking last week. So this is a kind of uh, proposition again and for consideration. Interactive and innovative uh, ways of the group engagement like simulation, it's great. Managing expectations. This is, I think that one of the most important thing because I already uh, can, uh, I have a premonition that you will ask me the question, what was the tangible kind of outcome, uh, what you expected, and uh, is it actually, you know, refurbish the way UN operates in the country? My answer is no. I don't think that it, like, it's not that, you know, the, today you wake up and there is a gray in the outside, you do the exercise and there is a light outside and it's totally, you know, put the, the, our thinking. I don't think so. But at the same time, what I say that, you know, this is 80, 20% like this for, and I think that 80% uh, like Pareto is, uh, it's every, everyone has this already high, but this exercise is improving a, a certain ways of thinking, improving the certain ways of the joint understanding that then you uh, contribute and kind of put as a thread in a UNSDCF discussion. I would not say that UNSDCF outcomes discussion like, oh my God, it was absolutely something innovative and we didn't see it before. No, it, it is very similar, but it's still when you start from a different starting point as a scenarios and you build in them, and then you later, after discussing outcomes, you feel about, oh my God, what, is, what, what if there is a 
crisis coming in and we are in a scenario four. So which activities my agency or one my result group or outcome group will have to take uh, into consideration to, to achieve the results. That's what, it, what it's about. So I don't say that it's, again, you know, makes a miracle, but it's, it simply improves the way we, we work. Uh, we uh, also considered engaging the government into exercise. In the end, we decided against it. We uh, only stopped at the moment of engaging external national experts. Uh, because, the, again, the uh, overt and kind of open and honest discussion would not have been possible uh, with the government there. Uh, on the operational things, uh, deciding uh, between keeping the agenda uh, and ensuring the flexibility. For example, we did not uh, even finalize one or two sessions because people were working on the previous sessions and there was so much dynamic that you simply, you know, scratch off certain elements of the agenda in the beginning. And we still advise, I think we think that our experience that having external facilitator is advisable. Uh, it first of all, it makes the, uh, the structure very crystallized and we, all, we simply uh, avoid uh, all the traps which have been before in, in other cases. So by this, I will uh, thank you for, for your attention and over to Kiki. Wow, Kadmola, thank you so much. That was really interesting, really insightful, very rich experience. I'm sure there's so many um, questions. Um, I know that the chat is quite, quite active. There were a number of things that I, I picked up listening to you. Just the idea of making it so inclusive, bringing in national experts, bringing in other voices. I think that really stood out to me. The way you use sort of a mixed methodology the innovation around the online tools to beef up the data. That's interesting. And I think it's very clear to all of us that just given the level of uncertainty in the world, you know, starting with the COVID pandemic that took us all unawares, the climate crisis that's been raging on, and then, you know, the war in Ukraine and many other wars around the world, I think it's very clear that, you know, it's a, the world is in a very volatile place. And if we're really to deliver on the SDGs within the 2030 timeline, we need to be prepared for anything and everything, you know. And for me, that's sort of the added value of these, uh, this foresight and scenarios planning is to think about best and worst case scenario. I like the way you said crazy futures, you know, to think outside of the box and try to imagine how well am I prepared to respond should X, Y, Z happen across all entities with all of our comparative advantages and even thinking together. Thinking together, I was particularly struck by the expertise you said the PMT brought into it in linking the CCA to the CF. I think that's really strategic, relevant, and important because all the agency CPDs, country program documents, would derive from the CF. So if that synergy is strong, then you know it looks like things could be more um, effective, efficient. So to kick things off, I'm, I'm going to look around and see, you know, colleagues, I would encourage you to raise your hands uh, if you have questions, but just to kick off this next segment, which is really, we have about 25 minutes for Q&A and for interaction and also for sharing other experiences. I know there are some colleagues on the line who may want to contribute from their own um, um, country context and so on. Um, a few questions for you, Kotmola. Um, how can foresight, given your experience, right? How can, and I hear you about managing expectations, but how can foresight help accelerate progress on the 2030 agenda in an integrated manner? I'm, and I'm adding that in an integrated manner because you know we, we hear about how the SDGs are integrated and divisible, but the fact of the matter is when we implement, we tend to be focused on particular goals and targets that are within our mandate areas as agencies. So this foresight exercise, how can it help accelerate progress on SDGs on the agenda in an integrated manner? The next question, how does policy scenario analysis incentivize joint programming and collaboration? I mean, I think the purpose of the, the reforms really was to bring the system together with a common CF and all of that. But in terms of real joint programming, what's the added value here of policy scenario analysis? And then finally, in your experience, which other tools can be deployed to support the strategic prioritization exercise, which is so important for the UNSCCF. So those are just three questions to kick us off. Maybe you can begin by addressing those, and then we look around for questions from the floor. Over to you, Kapola. Thank you very much. Uh, these are very um, 
tough questions, I would say, very difficult questions to answer. First of all, because I, we, we have to admit that uh, this scenario exercise has been only half a year ago, and uh, we, are, we just assigned the UNSDCF uh, last week, essentially. Uh, that's why it's on the one hand, uh, it's very hard to, to tell about the proof that we accelerate and how we accelerate. But having said that, uh, it's important to say that, uh, the, again, I, I, I somehow emphasized in my presentation that the acceleration of the, the, uh, the SDG agenda and the, in my honest opinion, the only way to accelerate the 2030 agenda is engaging with the government and uh, aligning, aligning uh, to the, the, the priorities of the government, but at the same time, making sure that the government is also contributes to the, uh, to the uh, uh, 2030 agenda. That's why I think that these scenario exercises and foresight, uh, although we did not present the results of this and we did not include the uh, government officials in the foresight scenario itself, but we, at the different fora, I know that resident coordinator raised uh, these issues with uh, in private conversations with their uh, development with our government partners. It's the one. So I think that bringing also and making the government aware that this exercise has been done. Also, we did not share the uh, the full report. Uh, also, again, the report is still available online. So theoretically, everyone everyone can look at it, and the result uh, scenarios are there. Uh, we, by the way, we publish them in the end, so they are not so easily, uh, you know, trackable, <laughs> honestly, because there are multiple sensitivities, but you understand that we are working with vis-a-vis -vis the national government, we don't want always, you know, them to raise this issue. But at the same time, what is important is that this uh, foresight, again, bringing the, gov the uh, or increasing or improving the adaptability and the flexibility of the uh, UN programming in the country and flexibility of the cooperation framework, um, open-mindedness, uh, I would say, to different scenario development. This is the way to accelerate the progress because we need to be exactly as you said, uh, you know, if someone told us three years ago before the COVID that we will end up in a situation of that every, you know, no uh, connections between the countries, you know, economies go down, now different uh, crises and, and conflicts in the world, we could not predict it. And that's why I'm saying that foresighting is not a predicting exercise, it's not forecasting. That's why we need to be rather open to many options and we ha have to keep in mind many tools and remain the flexibility. This is one of the, re uh, one of the lessons uh, of uh, another crisis in Kazakhstan. Uh, I, I spoke to resident coordinator in Kazakhstan after the after the crisis, she said that, you know, all this preparedness is the most important the preparedness is to keep the flexibility that of the flexibility of the reaction. That's the way that saves you in the end. And I think that this is the, the way in adaptability is the main thing that scenario forecasting and for, foresighting, sorry, uh, contributes. In the joint programming, uh, we use the results of the scenarios for in, in different uh, in different uh, areas, as I said, that for the PBF, for the Peace Building Fund, or discussing for other elements, uh, it's not always, of course, directly translated. But this understanding and the data which we collected is there behind uh, when when we want to work on joint programming. I'm the focal point of, for the PBF and Peace and Development Advisor, of course, Kyrgyzstan is PBF eligible country, so I can speak uh, quite uh, confidently that uh, this experience is, is taken into consideration. Uh, in when we speak about you know uh, other scenarios, uh, because this has become quite an attractive and fashionable topic in the UN, we also did the scenarios for Kyrgyz-Tajik uh, border conflict. So we use it for scenarios for other from tracking and monitoring the situation in other uh, in other areas, not necessarily UNSDCF. Uh, I, I was also engaged with the colleagues uh, with the DPPA on analyzing the uh, scenarios with the Afghanistan and Central Asia situation. So it's actually these tools are used to now throughout uh, multiple areas which we uh, support. So for example, these scenarios on Kyrgyz Tajik border, we use it to program the joint program for UNESCO, UN Women, OHCHR for the Kyrgyz Tajik cross-border cooperation programming. Of course, this is the most specific, it's not UNSDCF, because UNSDCF is, UNSDCF is, is rather a bird fly view of the country. So we, we look at the biggest 
biggest trends, digitalization, for example, or something. So more open government, less open government, uh, you know, uh, social cohesion, polarization grows, polarization goes down uh, or shrinks. Sorry. Uh, and then th that's the way it, it's not always directly translatable. But I think that it's translatable in the sense that we understand what is going on in the country and we respond to this through the multiple other sources because there is SDG fund and other MPTS that are, you know, uh, trigger our engagement. I hope I answered your questions. I would be open to uh, respond to others. Yes, absolutely. No, it's really, really um, insightful and enriching to hear from you. And, and I do take the point about foresight being different from forecasting and the main one of the main benefits is around having that flexibility and adaptability i think that's very um that's very critical given just all of the volatility around us so no thank you so much Kotmola. um i want to open up the floor i know we have our unfpa rep azamat i don't know if you're still here um, and if you want to, as Kamola had mentioned, he put you, I'm not the one putting you on the spot. He put you on the spot and said, you may wish to take the floor and share your own perspectives, given that you were part of this um, really interesting um, foresight exercise. Um, Azamat, would you like yeah, to- Yeah, I am. <laughs> you did actually. So hello, <laughs> colleagues. And yes, thank you for this opportunity, Kiki and Kutmala. I think yeah, Kutmala covered all interesting issues. And uh, I, I I would be honest with you, colleagues, you know, that uh, it's, it's a little bit noisy and you can hear some voices from children. So uh, when first time I uh, I saw it uh, uh, and I was like, why, why do we need this? I mean, why are you spending so time for this, you know, planning, understanding? I mean, sorry, I have delivery, yeah, I have implementation and all my colleagues also busy. And then step by step we understood and it's really important, uh, I think, task uh, and opportunities that we had, uh, which which was really useful. And uh, Kurtmala rightly mentioned the scenario D, for example, that I was in this group. Uh, actually, we can face it and we can see it now in Kyrgyzstan, it's going on scenario D. So it's really important to spend your time as head of agency or head of office or rep or deputy rep, whoever you are, colleagues, really spend and invest time for this discussion, for this dialogue to understand what's going on around you. We are always sitting in our blue box and I'm, I'm, as I'm saying, or, or as UNHP in orange box. And sometimes we need to go a little bit out from this box and understand what's going on around us. And for me, it was really crucial to invite civil society and experts that they can share their own perspective, how they see the situation, yeah? So I, I think um, during the development of cooperation framework, this scenario planning exercise helped us a lot on this. Over to you, colleagues, thank you. Azuma, thank you, thank you. I think that's a very strong vote of confidence in favor of the importance of this exercise. And I think we're really taking that home with us. So I appreciate you jumping in with that. Um, I see a few comments in the chat. So colleagues, if you've posted something in the chat, I'm gonna give you the opportunity, please feel free to either raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself. We're interested in hearing your own perspectives, but even your responses to the questions around how you think foresight can facilitate joint programming, can accelerate progress on the SDGs in an integrated manner, um, or even other tools that you think would be relevant for the kind of work that we're all collectively um, trying to do. I also want to note that um, the HLCP, the High Level Committee on Programs, has a foresight network that I think is co-chaired by UNESCO, Kotmola had mentioned UNESCO's expertise in this area. So there's series, there's a range of resources um, around, around foresight. And I'm the HLCP Sherpa for my organization. I've been in some of those discussions and it's really sort of, it helps you open up your thinking and helps you think outside of the box, which I think is critical um, given, given just the various contexts and crises all around us. I see Tomako has pinned the Foresight Network piece in there. It's endorsed by the CEP, so I think it's worth, it's worth a look for everyone on the call if you're interested. Um, let's see. I'm going round and round. Serge, I'm going to call on you, Serge. Do you have any perspectives you'd like to share with us or further questions for Komola? 
I, I think there is one question from Abdul Bakos uh, Abdurrahman. Yes, uh, on yes. the on the chat. There, yes, there, there we is. go. Looking back, uh, a few examples were mentioned, but more broadly, how has the foresight and alternative futures exercise influenced the content of the UNSTCF? Versus if you had prepared the UNSTCF without this exercise, what would you have done differently? I think that's a great question. Content wise, did it change what's in the UNSTCF? And you started touching on that a little bit, Kamola. So over to you. Yes, uh, because I, I think that that's a critical question. First of all, I mean, with 100 confidence, I cannot answer this question for one reason, because I couldn't say what would have happened if this didn't happen, right? Uh, it's kind of, uh, I'm again in peace building prevention dilemma. You cannot say that you prevented some conflict and something uh, didn't happen because you worked. <laughs> so it's, it's somehow this is a kind of dilemma. But I, I should say that uh, my, my uh, kind of observation is that certain topics and certain areas and uh, an awareness of certain <clears throat> gaps uh, has been, became more acute in the discussion over UNSDCF. Because when we developed in September and uh, the UNSDCF workshop uh, was, I think, in February or something, so it's five months and the UNCT has been growing, understanding that we are going into the worst case scenario, essentially. And then the UNS, uh, UNSDCF uh, and, and UN agencies have been stronger in promoting certain areas, uh, for example, human rights or governance issue or uh, or peace and that's why they were for example insisting that the word peace uh, uh, or social cohesion appears in the outcome definition uh, it's very hard to say that whether they would have been uh, also harder or uh, kind of more demanding if the scenario planning wasn't there hard to tell but again my observation that this awareness that we are going in a wrong direction as a country uh, that Kyrgyzstan is not going, you know, is sent in a bad direction, right? It's a, uh, it's, it made them aware to be also more, uh, how to say, courageous or more, um, you know, streamlined. For, if we go for the environment, also like linking, uh, you know, environmental issues with the stability, social cohesion as well. I think that this also interlinkages. It also helps because the scenario is not, it's also we took two, we take only two uncertainties, but we analyze them through the, you know, implications to on social situation, food availability, I don't know, uh, environment and others. So I think that this also interrelatedness and, you know, what actually cooperation frameworks wants uh, us to do now, the most recent guidance on the UNSDCF requires this, you know, multidimensionality, uh, and risk assessment, etc. I think that's what also happened during the discussion, and and that's the impact on the cooperation framework. I hope my answer, yeah. What I would have done differently, um, hard to tell. I think that at, at the moment we need to look at it uh, again at some at some point. We will be probably updating the scenarios during the next CCA update period. So uh, we will we will see how it will be done. But in in general, I think that uh, we did not commit two big mistakes so far. No, no. Thanks so much, Carmola. I think that's for me. Hearing you talk about sort of the interlinkages, so it almost forces you to see the interconnections across different areas, different sectors, different topics, and to think through your responses given the multidimensionality of a crisis or an issue or a circumstance. And I really think that that is critical to making development progress in this climate. So I think that's another huge added value of doing an exercise such as this and, and having that come through very clearly in the UNSTCF, as you rightly said, that's more the direction that the reforms are pushing us towards where the interlinkages, the interrelatedness across sectors, across the SDGs and the pillars of the CF come through very clearly. And that in itself should also facilitate joint programming, if you think about it, right? Because then we see the interconnections across our various mandates and we can come together more meaningfully, which again is at the heart of, of integration and integrated policy approaches, which is what this platform and this forum is all about. So, so thank you for bringing it very full circle for us in a practical and applied way. 
and, and we would look forward to, you know, your further reflections down the line and any other thoughts um, as the situation evolves, as you, as you guys continue to implement at the UNCT level, we'd like to hear, okay, this is how Foresight helped us. This is what we did differently. These are tweaks that we, we made. So I think down the line, Serge, we probably will invite Katmola and others back to have a 2.0 discussion around, um, around Foresight and its application and so on. Colleagues, I'm scanning the chat. I don't see any new questions. And I'm also looking at all the boxes. We still have a little bit of time. It's 8.47 and we don't need to stop until nine o'clock. So again, if there's anyone who, who would like to share. Okay, sir, do you have your hand up, please? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Kiki. Uh, thanks, Kudmola, for, uh, for that presentation. Uh, excellent presentation and a very uh, insightful experience from Kyrgyzstan. Um, uh, uh, thanks for mentioning that we can indeed bring uh, uh, Kodmola back later to, uh, to hear how it has evolved the experience uh, in, uh, in the country. Um, I, I've noticed, uh, Kodmola, that you mentioned uh, reaching out to a few agencies um, and uh, uh, to headquarters, right? And Kiki mentioned the uh, HLCP foresight network. Uh, my, my question is a lot more about how accessible has been uh, uh, that, that capacity to support, uh, to support you in the exercise. W was it accessible enough for you as a, as a UN city to, uh, to get support from uh, the UN system for, uh, for doing that foresight exercise? You also mentioned the issue of, uh, of the cost, uh, expertise uh, from external expertise, which was uh, quite price pricey i think i think you you mentioned that uh so from the pure uh, that experience of trying to access support to do the exercise in Kyrgyzstan, and given that many other uh, uh country teams are also now considering foresight it's uh, more and more mentioned uh, across the system how do you think that the support access to that support can be facilitated so that foresight as a useful exercise for a prioritization and for uh, understanding and telling cages between different policy domains, that tool, that the application of that tool gets scaled up across the UN system. So what would be your recommendations for uh, scaling foresight and, and facilitating access to support so that UNCT can deploy the tool effectively and easily? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Serge, for the for the question. Uh, I find that uh, in general, as I said, uh, when you come out, uh, there are so many people to help, uh, and uh, our DCO office and DPPA were very open, and in my case, they were very accessible. The one thing at the same time, we need to understand that their um, resources are limited. And I know that DPPA has been supporting scenarios in some other countries. And in my case, they said that they will be able to, uh, for example, to do only one or two days online, etc. So like facilitate. But they were also bringing us the other materials uh, and the you know, draft, draft agendas and many other lessons learned. So we learned. So I believe that we have the very accessible system and uh, very open to, to support. The only issue is that the resources, so if they had the more resources they could have done. Uh, I, I think that what can be improved is that because I'm again sitting with the, and why DPPA is important because I'm a Peace and Development Advisor, it's a joint DPPA and GP program, right? That's why I have also direct access and I had contacts, so it's also we build on that. Uh, but I think that over the time I saw that DCO actually is growing as a as a, in its coordination role uh, and regional coordination role and global coordination role as a kind of hub of the experience for the scenario planning. I know that they are doing already kind of uh, mapping and lessons uh, learned uh, thing. And I think that the DCO can be this kind of gate, gate opener or like the first contact uh, focal point for the scenario planning, because usually at the UNCT, it's still triggered by RST. So it's very natural that uh, actually DCO becomes this kind of first, first, line, of the con first con <laughs> line of contact for the uh, resident coordinators. I, I think that it's great. Uh, there is already some capacity. I know that we have been supporting. In addition to this IPN, I already actually uh, shared my experience with DPPA, the DCO. 
uh, previously and also with the network of the PDAs in the in the region. So it actually is this topic is very how to say attracts a lot of attention and it really works. I think that still it's it's really worth doing it. Uh, in terms of the cost, in in the end, our cost was not super big. I think that it was around, uh, again, I'm speaking about money here, but the uh, group, $30,000 uh, or less even, like maybe, yeah, around 30,000 or maybe less because it's essentially three days workshop plus preparation, couple of days and plus couple of days of the report writing and preparation of the final report. So I think that it's like, uh, I don't know, 20 days altogether, because we also in, but I, there we also had national expert to support us. So I think that all together is around 30, but not more. Um, so yeah, I hope I responded to your question. DCO as the main gate, I think that it's also very well placed. And I think that they also aware of this kind of uh, need and the, uh, you know, uh, opportunity and they already invest into it. So that, that's at least I see it in the, our regional and global DCO gem contacting. Thank you so much, Carmola. And I believe you really did address the question. Um, Serge, I think, yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, if, if I may have a follow-up while colleagues are, are thinking about their own questions. Uh, Carmola, the, you, you did mention that engagement of the government was, uh, would have altered uh, the, the nature of the discussions. But we've seen in some other contexts where foresight is actually applied to support the government in the in developing national their national plans. Uh, is there any opening or opportunity in Pakistan for uh, that to happen? Uh, this is uh, so such again. These questions are so well targeted because Ozonia's, I mean, the resident coordinator's vision, initial vision, was that yes, we do it for our UNCT and SDCF. But the next stage should be supporting the government uh, on scenario planning on their development plan, because there are different issues. Uh, there are different issues with the you know development plan, and we see that scenario, the you know regional situation, global situation evolves, and they need to be uh, you know brought. And this awareness of the scenario planning and scenario thinking or foresight thinking should be there in the government. So. I know that the resident coordinator has discussed this topic again uh, informally. Uh, we again, nothing moved in a practical terms, but I think that this will be further explored. So we, we are hoping that this will, will come out in the end somewhere uh, and some it will be, 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 be bear some fruits. Great. No, thanks so much, Carmola. Um, let's see, I'm gonna scan one last time. And um, we're actually close to the end of our allotted time. It's 8.55. So colleagues, if there's no other question or comment, allow me on behalf of all of us and, um, and on behalf of the IPPN to extend very warm thanks to you, Kormola. I think you've really brought a lot of um, insight, perspectives, the experiences you shared are very rich a lot of food for thought for all of us. And for those of us who are learning about foresight for the first time, a lot of interest to, to read more and investigate and even utilize this approach in various, various areas of our work. So, you know, warm thanks to you. And of course, to all the participants for, for tuning in from across the world, for engaging, for the interaction, for the questions, for the comments um, in the chat. Please note that Kamola's presentation, along with the recording for the session and other material, uh, will be posted on the events page later today. You should all be receiving um, those emails as well. Again, on behalf of the IPPN team, I invite you to join us through the links posted in the chat and share your own experiences and practical tools for policy integration. We're always happy to receive those from you. And finally, please mark your calendars for our next Knowledge Cafe, which is scheduled to take place on Wednesday, 13 July at the same time, 8 a.m. New York time. I look forward to seeing you all then. Extending very warm thanks to everyone, and in particular to Serge and colleagues at UNDP who are really the backbone of pulling these events, these collaborative um, cafes together. Um, so thanks once more. All session materials will be uploaded uh, on the IPPN engagement spaces, including the dedicated Spark Blue event page. 
So with that, a warm thank you from me, Kiki Diriku, I'm at UNFPA. I'm delighted to have met you all. Do have a lovely day and a lovely rest of the week. Bye-bye.